Okay. Um, so welcome everyone to the um, to the Acorn uh, code and project walkthrough. Um, <clears throat> I think we have two hours like at our disposal. I don't know whether we'll use the full time or uh, less than that or uh, what, but yeah, we have a great window of time to be able to go uh, deep into as many like kind of questions and um, uh, aspects of the project as we want. It's a small group right now, so we'll be able to like just make it more conversational and um, and uh, yeah, really um, start by sharing a little bit of uh, history or context, um, which is uh, starts with. Um, Myself, uh, at least for me, my story with it um, starts with being on the Hall of Chain development team uh, as uh, mostly as the technical documentation person at the time. Um, and I attended uh, a retreat in Montreal with the development team at which we um, discussed discussed the development workflow um, that that they were using and found that. Uh, there was an interest in trying something as an alternative to the, the mainstream um, agile software development workflow. And, um, and there was an exploration into what that could be. Uh, it was a playful discussion and the metaphor and uh, the metaphors and kind of playful ideas around um, squirrels and acorns came up in that discussion um, as a kind of productivity metaphor of um, of how everyone keeps busy and uh, gets gets all the work done, so um, and it it kind of begins with the idea of um, a tree, which is I think why it squirrels and metaphors come into play, because um, the the idea is to think of all of the work, uh, all of the work that we may uh, set out for ourselves can exist in a tree-like structure. Um, it can be visualized and imagined and and portrayed in a tree-like structure where at the very top you have your uh, you have your um, one thing we call them is your uh, uh, aspirational intended outcome and uh, so that's the outcome that you'd like to see in the world and you start to break that down into smaller and smaller outcomes and eventually the outcomes become uh, eventually the outcomes become small enough concrete tasks that you can just um, do them. Whereas at the high level, they're not things that you can just immediately do. There are things that, um, that in a sense you have to do a million little things in order to, in order to reach that, to reach that big goal. Um, and it's by greening the tree, which is like when you complete something, you green the tree, that you uh, that you achieve your intended aspirational outcomes. And so these were the metaphors, and um, the uh, the the thing that set the idea for Acorn into motion, and it was prototyped using uh, using the Miro um, the Miro real time board uh, technology, and just essentially visually. Um, kind of done on a visual uh, shared real time vi visual canvas, uh, online canvas that uh, that everyone could edit and see the work and visualize the work that way. Um, it seemed to work well enough. It obviously had its own constraints too because it wasn't designed specifically for that purpose. It was sort of being uh, experimented with for that purpose and um, when I left Hollow in um, July, at the end of July of last year, I um, started working with uh, Harrisbron Enterprises, which is Eric Harrisbron's uh, other business, not Hollow. It's kind of it's very related to Hollow since it's um, owned by uh, Harrisbron Enterprises, owned by one of the co-founders of Hollow, and um, and he. Uh, within Harris Front Enterprises, they wanted to fund Acorn development. And so uh, so myself and uh, Pega, we took on our project uh, in our new business that we were starting. And um, 
so yeah, so the process began with um, Pega really, uh, Pega is a, I would, I would want to give the, the kind of mic to Pega for a few minutes to talk about, um, to talk about uh, what her process was like as a designer at the, at the kind of handoff of working on Acorn. You up for that, Pega? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so um, when, um, when we received the Acorn project, um, we wanted to really have a design um, the centered uh, process uh, for it. So um, we started from um, some of the user experience research uh, methods, uh, like our user stories um, and uh, being UX templates, uh like uh, seeing what our assumptions are for the project uh and uh throughout the design process we want to evaluate those assumptions so based on uh the assumptions and the questions we answered uh i create uh some of the wireframes and mockups uh uh for acorn and then we started working on the code um uh, so, Connor, do you want to continue that, or do you want me to? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. I mean, I think it'd be cool um, to give people uh, a visual on some of the designs and what, what the design process has been, too, so we can either kind of do that. Maybe you can work on pulling some up, just, just, just a quick kind of flash around and pan around sure. um, to see. Uh, how in depth that process was. Um, before we're going to spend lots of time on the on the code, but um, but the code is hugely informed. Uh, I, I mean, essentially, yeah, the whole development process is driven by the design process. So um, it's a huge component of of the work. Um, Yeah, so there was a period where Pega was really busy working on um, working on design, uh, user experience research, and um, conversations trying to drag all of us, myself included, through um, through a process that uh, none of us were super familiar with to just try to try to get at the core of what is Acorn, um, what is what is Acorn trying to really be, and um, And yeah, so that, that was a really interesting process in terms of uh, that facilitation. And I think it brought it a lot more down to ground from what it had actually been up to that point. And um, yeah, so in a minute, we're going to see uh, once Pega has one of the designs up kind of um, where the process, where the process started in terms of design. And I mean, you'll see what it looks like. You'll see it also like in action as a, functioning app um, in this demo too. But, uh, but yeah, you'll see where it started and see what, um, what all of this looks like. And uh, yeah, so then we, we went into development starting in, I think around October was when we really started to develop. And uh, when you see the designs, you'll um you'll see and and the metaphor that we're working with of the tree um so obviously it's a very kind of visual uh almost like a data visualization but kind of in interactive um and so from a technical standpoint um there's a there's definitely that big upfront data visualization component that we had to uh address I have partially a background in that so that was um, that was not too difficult to get started with um, but for me it had been interesting because I had uh, been a I'd been working on the technical documentation of hollow uh, or for hollow chain uh, but this was my first experience of going truly in uh, Tr truly into the app development process, like beyond, uh, I see um, Jacob here and um, 
there's been other I think you know people who have encountered at hackathons um, and and stuff and it's one thing to hack on the weekend on a project another to uh, set into a long-term development project um, and to really try to take your idea through to through to completion and through to uh, a fully functioning thing that you can ship and get people um, get people using. Nice. Oh, here's the um, so here's some of the early the early designs. Super um, super bare bones, uh, but at its essence, um, you're you're building this this tree of uh, outcomes. And each um, each outcome has a status, so to speak, indicated by the color, where uh, essentially from from what we call an uncertain goal or an un uncertain outcome through to a complete outcome, uh, which is where you've like which is where you've entirely finished it. Um, but there's I think we've got five different colors which represent statuses. Um, now there's uncertain, incomplete, uh, in process, in review, and complete. Pega, is your um, screen share? Oh, you brought it down? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, just go to one of the. Um, Just wanted to highlight the thing. not just the status thing, but in fact the tools uh, that you, that you use to design and how they supported the development process. Yeah. So I can share the screen with you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. So actually, you can pull it out of out of full screen, uh, so they can see the tool. Mm -hmm. So because um, the tool itself is quite cool, um, do you want to talk about it for a second, Pega? Sure. Yeah. So uh, our main tool that we used for the design process uh, was the Adobe XD, uh, which is a pretty great. Um, like very um, great flow for um, for designing um, wireframes and mockups and even prototypes. Um, uh, it's also great because you can um, share specifications of the design with the developers uh, to make a more more accurate uh, development out of the design um, mockups. Um, so we really benefited from the tool um, in the process, um, and um, for example, this is a mock-up for uh, the expanded view mode uh, for a goal card. Um, I'm just gonna go over like how how this is done. Um, So these are the mockups, uh, uh, which is one level uh, more detailed than the wireframes, which are done through sketching and like just figuring out the information architecture and the user flow. Then these are more detailed and close to the actual app. So can you bring us to? Um to a link how uh, to the um, to the Miro board and mm -hmm. um, sure. and how you link to designs and open up to an XD. Sure. So we used uh, Miro. Um, as our initial project management um, board while developing Acorn, and we are intending to uh, switch to Acorn. Um, 
Um, so I'm just gonna move. So you'll see how um, you'll see how we've been using uh, the mirror board as a sort of um, you know obviously while we've been in the process of developing a board we couldn't uh, our goal was to reach the point at the earliest possible moment that we could to switch to using Acorn to develop Acorn further. So essentially using it, switching over to it to use it as a project management tool. So I think Warritz has commented on that and uh, because it's still, it's like, does that work yet? And it's it's kind of like on the cusp of working um, and yet not, not yet, not quite. Um, it, feels it feels like, like we're just around the corner, corner from, from essentially being able to switch over, over from Miro and GitHub issues as our project tracking to um, to like using Acorn itself. Um, and yeah, it's awesome. It's exciting uh, because obviously we're going to learn a ton about uh, building a great product out of Acorn by using it. Um, up until this point, yeah, we've been using Miro and GitHub issues uh, to kind of track to track the work. That's, that's a, a very, very high level view of our tree of our of our uh, our we, as we can call it our state of affairs tree. Um, and they kind of show uh, at a high level different rounds of work that we've gone through. So we've kind of broke it down, uh, the, the passing of time, um, different, different iterations, iterations of the design, design and basically design, design goes into development. And we, we green this whole tree from left to right. Um, and uh, associated with the work as it's been broken down, uh, there's cards that are related to design. And those cards, uh, those cards host a link to a design. Um, which Peggy, you would open up one of those. Yeah, sure. Or show show an example. Can I zoom in on an example? Yeah. Uh, so this is a prioritization of the goals feature, and grouped to that node is a uh, Adobe, Adobe XD link, link which launches, launches you out to such a fantastic, fantastic feature of um, XD, which is basically publish your designs to straight to web. Um, and uh, they offer a sort of like a specs mode that is highlighting there too, which takes you as a developer into um, a, a mode in which you've, you've got, got all the assets, assets uh, handy yeah. there to draw on. And um, so like, this is where we start when we look at um, going and developing something new. You start out with this specification. It's got all the sizes of everything and the, um, the assets, the color codes, you know, the hex codes and all of this stuff uh, is all stored in here. So there's a really efficient handoff from design to development that requires very little back and forth between the designer and developer, which is a notorious kind of tension point in, I don't know, development workflows. Um, I'm really, I'm really enjoying it. Um, you still do need some, you still need communication. Uh, there still needs to be some communication back and forth between say design and development in order to break down how certain things should work, specifications and translating them into the, uh, the code. But um, uh, especially with Peg and I working together in the same physical space, uh, that is bridged fairly smoothly. So you see our tree is in various states of completion. Some things are in review, that's blue. Some things are uh, incomplete, that's yellow. Some things are complete, that's green. And Miro has done a reasonably good job of um, letting us work with this concept of a, of a state of affairs tree um, because it's a very full-featured full -featured tool. Um, yeah. Peggy, anything else to say about Miro and the and using the tree on Miro? Um, sure. So yeah, um, yeah, Miro has been really interesting. 
tool for project management for us. Uh, it's a pretty, un, I would say, unconventional way of uh, like this whole um, tree making for the goals and hierarchy, hierarchy of the goals and stuff like that. Um, but because very visual, it's, it's really helpful uh, in giving us a more like a holistic picture of the project and the process of the project. Um, what uh, we found that Miro is lacking is uh, uh, the ability to really um, switch between ways of looking at the tree or at the goals. Uh, and um, so we are really excited uh, to use Acorn for our own process too because uh, we are going to have um, different view modes like a priority view mode uh, or timeline view mode that kind of creates a more um, I would say holistic um, uh, picture uh, for different kinds of needs uh, throughout the project. So that was just a quick view of how we work cool. on design to yeah, code. Thanks. Um, I'll pause and um, just uh, take a minute to ask if there's questions or um, comments or what's coming up for people um, at this point after seeing that introduction. What's on people's mind? I've got a question. Uh, um, I mean, uh, I, mean, I like everything, all of this, but, um, you know, maybe another, uh, you know, another session, you know, there might be two or three sessions where you take a project and you show us how you would start putting it, you know, planning out, you know, four or five sprints, um, in a real project as a community. Um, that's just a suggestion for, yeah, like as the next stage of all of this. Yeah. So, uh, you mean, Okay, well, you, um, okay. Um, yeah, you just mean actually like kind of illustrating like the planning process, like really, um, yeah, like the workflow process. Pretty much. I mean, I think mm -hmm. you guys have got a lot of um, experience in it now, and it, mm -hmm. it would come a bit more second nature than someone like us mm -hmm. or someone like mm -hmm. me doing it. Um, yeah, you know, yeah, a lot more about it and how you would approach a new project and plan it out into yeah. a tree like yeah. structure. Cause I mean, if I do it, I'm just going to go off in my own pattern of thought, but you guys have already been through a lot of pains anyway. Mm. I think there will be quite a number of different ways to really use it in the sense that uh, it could fit a number of different molds or contexts, but, um, but yeah, it's sharing some of the best, I don't know if there's best practices yet. There's maybe good practices um, or, or interesting, um, some some interesting lessons um yeah before uh before we kind of uh, one distinction that has come up definitely is that d at different stages of a project um there's a different work kind of workflow that makes sense like um like it's great to have it's definitely great to have a rhythm and to have some some sprints when you're at the um, when you're at the stage the early stage where you're not you haven't yet released even the first the first product you're just in pure you're just in pure development uh, design and development so there was like one uh, there was I felt like we needed to use a different workflow when we were building from scratch and trying to build out over a couple months, like the first, the first release or so to speak, the first iteration from then once we had that, then we could strike more of a rhythm of, okay, well now we have to incorporate integrating feedback into our process um, to listening to people listening to uh, and doing the user testing and um, integrating that kind of new information. So, um, 
then we had to kind of switch up our switch up our cycle um, and develop more of a more of a cadence. Yeah, like you saw back, we had the rounds, um, and the the rounds were kind of like week long things where there'd be some design that would happen, and then the week following uh, d where design happened, development would kind of come in and start to work in the part of the tree that was um, uh, that was greened in terms of design the week before and the week following that we're able to have development come into that that space on the tree so in fact there were two different rounds happening simultaneously there was there was a design round which was one round ahead and there was a development round which was one round behind um, while we were in that early uh, early build stage. Now, now we're more, more like lined, lined up. up. Uh, there's, yeah. Anyways, other questions? Uh, just as well for the folks who've joined, like uh, uh, since we did at the start, we did some quick intros. Maybe you could just drop in the chat um, if that's where you're comfortable. Uh, if not on video, just uh, a hello and why you're here, what brings you here. That would be cool. Um, and any questions you have or your key key interests um, in being here, what what you'd most want to hear or get out of it, because Really, we're all just here and it's for you. So, as it stands, um, I'll open up uh, kind of like the, the, the demo and just show you what the kind of current, current draft is like. And then we'll kind of reverse engineer it, so to speak, and just start to uh, look under the hood and look at lessons learned, building with Holochain. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'll do screen share. Okay, so first of all, I want to say that um, when you're building a Holochain app, um, of course, the, one of the underlying assumptions of Holochain is that uh, the data is going to live on people's devices. That's one of the that's one of the key assumptions is that um, people self-host uh, their data, and so obviously we're going to be running some form of native apps or at least local apps. You're not going to be just going through the browser and uh, unless you use a hollow hosted version of it, but um, that's not ready yet. Uh, so, so as it stands, we, we come up with different ways of um, making it so that people can use, use it, just run it natively on their device. And basically there's two, uh, there's two main strategies that, we and other people are, are, are typically considering utilizing. One is um, Hall Escape at the moment, which is essentially a stand-in, uh, a stand-in for uh, a app store, so to speak. It's so it's not a store because you're not buying anything. Um, it's essentially like a testing and development, and debugging and uh, and prototyping environment, and so. Uh, I have Holoscape on my computer. I think there's some pictures of it here. Yeah, here. Um, so, so you click into the to the App Store within Holoscape. Actually, Acorn is there. Um, you can install it and then run it built into Holoscape, and that's one uh, sort of deploy deploy target. Um, that's one way to essentially release your app if you think that 
your users are using Holoscape or just want to test it and that kind of thing, then you can use Holoscape. Um, but we wanted to do kind of like as well, like a one click install standalone application. Um, and so for that, we rely on um, the Electron uh, the Electron framework from GitHub, which essentially allows you to build for web, but release it as a native app. Um, release your, your programs as native applications. It's used by big companies, I don't know, Slack. Uh, Slack was built with Electron, all kinds of things are, in fact, Electron apps under the hood. And, uh, and while, even while I was in Holo, um, and still now I'd done quite a few experiments with Electron. And so we figured it was a good, it was a good option for, um, for trying to release a standalone version of Acorn. And uh, with much difficulty, <laughs> um, we did it. So, um, so I can show you Acorn, which is a whole chain application just in my, uh, in my file system. bringing it over, uh, sitting in my file system as, as an application here. So Acorn, that's our little loco. Um, and that is because it's yeah bundled into Electron. And uh, so I think I've essentially cleared my um, my version locally, which means that when I launch the application, oh, bring it over, um, it, it loaded really fast. And I kind of wanted to show you even just like from the fresh launch, it's loading on my other screen. Sorry, just a second. There we go. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, yeah, so it was only when we were getting to the point where we were gonna release that we really wanted to bring it to the point where it had like a splash screen and stuff like this. So um, yeah, we designed this splash screen so that introduces people to Acorn. Welcome to Acorn, collaborate with your team to accomplish your complex project by visualizing and managing your dreams, goals, and tasks. Help your team feel accomplished and aligned. You and your team are able to see the complex project you're working on from multiple view modes. Visually connect the small units of work that need to be done, the broader context of the greater goals. Everyone sees the progress being made, feels accomplished, know clearly where they're headed. A collaboration happen peer to peer. Help your distributed team to stay on track of changes and updates, communicate easily, avoid double work, and help each other accomplish your goals. Acorn is even built on peer-to-peer -peer technology called Holochain. Assuming that we can actually distribute this to people who've never heard of Holochain. Um, yeah. None of us is intelligent as all of us. Completed goal, now wondering what makes sense to focus on next. You and your team members can weigh in and vote on different metrics that inform the priority of goals to ease the challenge of decision making. So sign me up. This is our squirrel. <laughs> um, so just fill in a little profile. Kind of classic. You can use a at the moment, you have to use a web image as a, um, you can use a web image as a profile picture. Um, you know, just leave it blank. And um, yeah. Can you add your picture to the front? Since I'm not sure. Oh yeah, okay, sure. Um, Welcome to Acorn. So this is your uh, this is your canvas, and uh, this is where you start out creating goals um, and creating 
your tree. So just to let you know where we're at in the process, uh, we call this release, uh, which actually we haven't even released to GitHub, quite this version that you're seeing here, um, version 0 0.2.1. And the, 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 the fact that the first number is zero is important um, because we haven't even hit a first major release. This is, this is like our third minor release. Uh, this is a very early in the development process in, in so many senses. Um, it may look uh, relatively finished, but it is not at all finished. We are still very much in the kind of testing process, as in we would um, we'd like to do user testing uh, and really iterate and refine it, make sure that we um, uh, know exactly essentially what to prioritize next and that kind of thing, and start using Acorn to build Acorn. So that's part of our, our next goals. Um, yeah, so one of our goals is use Acorn to build Acorn. Um, it starts out with the color red because the color red signifies what we call an uncertain uh, outcome, which means that we haven't actually evaluated it for its like complexity or scope yet. Um, meaning we don't know how big or how small this particular this particular thing is. Um, by holding click, by having this selected and uh, uh, holding G and clicking on a new empty space, then we can create a new node. As we add, uh, as we add new things to the tree, like um, the tree is auto auto adaptive to the layout to the information that we're that we're plugging in. So this is one big improvement over using Miro, where we had to manually uh, we had to manually sort everything, and you'd spend your time on the wrong stuff. You'd spend your time moving things around, trying to make the right space on the tree, when what you want to be doing is focusing on the content and imagining your uh, aspiring intended outcomes. Um, so just to show how it kind of... Uh, how it kind of breaks down. Now, um, there's so many things uh, I could show you already. I don't know how quick or how slow to go through the app itself, or is this going in under under the hood to technology? So, um, yeah, I suppose I could use some feedback on on that. But I will give you a quick, at least at least bread first uh, show of, show of the app. So, so just like show you a quick overview of what's here. You've got a quick edit menu uh, with some of the key different options of um, of uh, these outcomes. Setting time frames, like essentially calendars, um, who's working on it or who's yeah assigned or however you interpret that. The status, set this one to in review, maybe I've worked on it. Um, so that's the quick edit. You also just quick edit the title here, user testing, change. Um, and uh, another interesting one is hierarchy, where uh, this gets at the idea of the tree that some things, such as this one, are like root goals. Um, other ones are way down the tree. And we're still testing out how this actually kind of is implemented, but other ones are leaf goals, and leaf goals are the like the smallest units of work meaning that they're the ones that uh, when you're going around actually like coming to, you know, so kind of logging on to work in a way, you're looking for those smalls um, and you're looking for the smalls that feed into probably the highest priority, the uh, highest priority items as indicated by the votes that people are able to make on priority. So um, 
This is actually kind of cool because it shows you an aggregated view of uh, metrics on, on priority. And uh, the metrics are derived from different votes that people can cast on how important is this, how urgent, uh, how impactful, how much effort is this going to be. And with only one vote, the averages reflect uh, the single vote, but this, is, this will change based on multiple user inputs to show an average here, your vote here, you can always update it. So this is one view that we call this view the map view. And the other view uh, that you can enter, and we think about having even more view, different kinds of views in the future, um, different ways of looking at the same information that help you with your, with your workflow. So on the left is the tree, actually in a different form, a nested uh, indented tree, collapsible. And um, if nothing has, I think something, I just voted on something. So um, I guess it was this, node by node. So uh, how this works is that when you click on something on the left, it contextualizes stuff into the right so that you can see what's the most urgent and important, uh, what's less urgent, more important in this space. This is where um, node by node is currently falling. If I change my vote, uh, being the only voter in the space, then uh, this will bump up to here. So you see how these things move around. And you can look at these different priority matrices. These are well-known um, ways of prioritizing things, the urgent and important matrix and the impact and effort. So this should be familiar at least to people who kind of like used uh, techniques like this for prioritization. And, uh, oh yeah, the expanded view. This is uh, all the metadata kind of, or the, the, full, the full interaction with a goal um, where you can have a, a fuller feature set of what you can do with it, a comment feed, actually. Um, and also an activity history of the changes that people made. This connects well with uh, Holochain's feature of essentially everything is append only, uh, meaning that the history of each entry data point is kept. And so we just retrieve that history naturally from Holochain and we build this little activity history view out of that. And um, yeah, you can set the same, you can set the same things here. This is kind of highlighting what's to come. Things, certain things are faded out. And uh, conceptually, there's some things that aren't, uh, that aren't full featured yet, such as it, it's very faint here. But the idea will be that for a particular goal, you can see how many of its little leaf goals are completed, meaning you can get a really good idea for a very high level goal, uh, just how much of that work is done and how much is outstanding or how much isn't even evaluated yet, in which case uh, it's still kind of red and so you feel, so it's uncertain. You've got uh, data export as JSON and CSV. Uh, for kind of backing things up. You've got a guidebook in here to show you around new, new users how to, how to do stuff, shortcuts, and um, you're able to change your profile. This is your, uh, your public key in case we ever want to do other stuff with Holochain with that. So that comes, that comes up from Holochain. That's, the, uh, that's essentially your identity. Um, and you've got your um, status. We're not really doing anything with this yet either, but the idea is that this will be a fairly real-time collaborative experience too. Actually, it's a little bit of a, a, uh, a leap, but I wanted to send it to Pega, um, the app as well, for her to open up so that you can see uh, that in fact this thing is working um, this thing is working peer to peer, and it's not just on my my computer. Yeah, um, the question in the chat is: Are you planning to connect it with Persona's app? And yeah, we would we would 
we really would like to do that um, because, uh, well, we wanted to ship it standalone, first of all, um, which is why we built a little bit of profile stuff. But essentially, you could connect it quite easily to the persona stuff, in which case you could just like really easily pre-populate, um, say, a username, first name, last name, profile picture. Like, you definitely would want to do that so that you could um, save people time. OK, Peggy, you have, you have AirDrop open, Peggy? Yeah, so she's going to get the application from me, open it up, um, actually after we do a quick uh, thing to make sure that it's not uh, going to break. Give me one second. She's going to have to register. Um, we had a big lesson that we learned that I want to talk about as she's um, getting it ready because uh, around Christmas time and in the first month or two of this year, uh, we were really struggling to um, get what we call multiplayer, um, which is the actual um, you know, collaborative experience of multiple people collaborating on a tree. Um, and the challenge we were facing is that we weren't sure whether, essentially it worked fine in development mode as single player. So you were just developing the whole thing works very smoothly. It's very responsive. Um, uh, stop it, restart it, works great. But it's not networked. So it's not connecting to any other nodes. Um, then whenever we would like kind of try, try to link it up and network it with the other nodes, then we'd, um, then we'd see it pretty much slow down to a crawl and then a stop and then a crash. It would just really bog down. Now, what was unclear is whether um, that was something we were doing in the Acorn code or whether that was something that was going on in Holochain. They were rapidly iterating, cutting new releases of Holochain. And uh, it, was, it was obvious that um, uh, Pegas goal just came in. So that's a... Uh, that's our evidence of our multiplayer, um, pretty much real time experience. When she's um, when she's making changes, they're uh, they're syncing to my to to mine pretty much in real time. Same thing with mine back to hers. Which of course not a breakthrough for for web um, uh, standard web based experiences, but. Uh, for us, and it was just very recently, it was a breakthrough in um, it was a breakthrough in our work with Holochain and building Acorn on Holochain. Just in the last two weeks, we've uh, successfully seen we've successfully enabled this responsive multiplayer um, scenario. The last release that we did of Acorn, which is like downloadable on our um, on our Acorn release project here, uh, v0.2.0. That's not uh, exactly the one that I'm running here, but this one only has minor changes, but it's way more, it's, it's way faster um, than this one. So we fixed a performance issue that we're in the process of um, still releasing. Thanks, Pega, for the um, demo. Uh, I think I was talking about the 
the lesson or the I don't know just the process of um, getting getting through from single player to multiplayer and yeah we were struggling to identify the source of the issue because it didn't look like we were doing anything different in acorn than other haps that we were seeing developed and yet we were seeing them having success where acorn wasn't um where acorn was having challenges so it was unclear uh but i i couldn't see anything that gave me a clear signal that it was what was going on in Acorn versus what was going on in Holochain. Um, but we started to kind of isolate it down to the idea that it was our attempt to reach a real-time uh, real collaborative experience that was causing the problem. And the, um, this is kind of a, yeah, the start of a, the start of a more technical discussion, but essentially um, to, to achieve close to real-time performance what we were doing from the user interface is we were going uh we were going back to holochain every couple of seconds and saying hey anything new anything new anything new anything new and uh basically we were just hammering holochain with with requests i didn't think it was hammering because you come from a web development experience and there shouldn't be any there shouldn't be any difficulty um uh, making a request to the server every, every three seconds, that's like pretty reasonable, pretty, uh, pretty standard. Um, but obviously something was at play in Holochain's current architecture or, um, or how we implemented Acorn backend that um, made it so that making, requesting all of this data, uh, for example, okay, any new squirrels, any new comments, any new goals, any new votes, um, all of these different things, we were uh, we were trying to refetch and refetch again and again. And when we started, when we implemented um, when we implemented what's called signals in Holochain, uh, where instead of the the client, which is the user interface, requesting data again and again and again from the server, when we implemented signals, which is uh, Holochain and the server. Um, just running locally, but uh, Holochain, the server would um, push new data down to the user interface. And that's very resource efficient because that only happens when new data is received over the network. And so uh, the after we made this change, which actually after all, everything turned out to be a very simple change to make, I did it in an afternoon. Um, it was like, it was, uh it was so much faster there have been a couple of iterations of performance improvements which i think are important to mention to people here if you're doing hap development um key moments in yeah seeing performance improvements so um i'll slow down for a second and um ask about ask if there's any questions and uh yeah Ref peg has been modifying the tree <laughs> hey uh connor this is lily uh just a question on um, what you just mm -hmm. said about signaling which is so uh, that's a synchronous push from the server side, right? So notifying only when changes come in. Mm -hmm. uh, can you think of scenarios where that should not be used? I mean, is there any reason why? Well, I guess you, mm -hmm. you might want to do polling if the client does not want to deal with uh, or is not able to deal mm -hmm. with a synchronous push. Mm -hmm. Is that... Is that yeah, that's that's true. Video? I think it's not right for every 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 situation. I really like the the acorn uh, demo that you just did. I mean, the fact that you can um, you know just manage it in the tree. It's a very natural way to visualize the decomposition of you know uh, a breakdown of tasks. Mm. So it reminded me a, a little bit of a mind map, but obviously mm -hmm. acorn has a lot more. So it's uh, has a lot more detail and con contextualization around 
the different tasks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it's like aiming it's itself. It's aiming itself at, at workflow, not just, um, not just brainstorming. I like to think of it as sort of combining the best of modernism and postmodernism as in like a network of nodes, but also there are lines through it towards uh, outcomes. So, right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. So um, I was curious because Jacob is here too. Um, and we, we could, we could go more into the code um, again, at least for a, like, you know, 10 minutes or something like that so that we have kind of a record of it and, and have something to reflect on and, share uh share with the world too because that was one of the uh the intentions from the call was to uh at least give people an intro to the code and that kind of thing um it seems you're, you're all all of you who are here are technically inclined and interested in the development process i think so that's well well suited um Jakob, if i'd ask them about um their development background and stuff like that what about what about you? How just quickly? How um, are are you actively developing Holochain, uh, something or other, uh, or um, yeah? What's your what's your development context? I guess so. So uh, I have now because I'm working on the let's say Hol Hol Holochain community map. So I kind of jumped into Vue and GraphQL, but um, in terms of Holochain, so I was I was learning Rust a few months back, and uh, I was trying to rewrite the Cointos. So I have basics in Holochain, kind of right. the Holochain things. But right now, uh, I am getting back to it actually. So catching up okay. with all the changes. But yeah, I'm I'm definitely planning on diving into it now in quarantine. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Cool. Cool. Awesome. Um, yeah, so I'll go back to screen share and, um, doo -doo, and give you a tour of how it's all set up. I shared the wrong screen. Yeah. Cool. So everything, all of the, the code and everything for Acorn lives under the Harris Brown Enterprises H-BE um, GitHub organization, um, as I said, because uh, they're funding it and they're also, in a lot of senses, I mean, uh, the uh, in some ways, there's a there's a growing team of people on the Harris Brown Enterprises uh, as well that intends to use Acorn. So it's kind of self funding, if you will, because it intends to both use it and to release it and share it with people. Um, and so there's four there's four repositories that relate to Acorn. And just as an overview, Acorn Docs is purely documentation. It's some of the vision statements and um, stuff that uh, stuff that gives you an idea without having to download anything or um, whatever of like, what is it? And um, uh, under vision, there's this big document too that kind of outlines the ontology. It's it's not a white paper, obviously, but it's you know something like that. It's just uh, conceptualizing the Acorn methodology, and then um, then you've got the two core components uh, where the bulk of the code really lives. That's Acorn UI and Acorn HC. Acorn HC for Holochain. Um, I am still torn about whether to call Holochain a server or a backend or not because um, I don't know. I think it kind of confuses. I think it confuses things. People know what a server is, and Holochain isn't necessarily a server. So there's something about something running local first and yet being the thing that a UI talks to that I haven't quite 
pin down the language for that yet. You know, oh, curious about how other people, if, uh, what language you use. Um, I usually call it a protocol. Protocol. What about a data layer? Yeah, data. Yeah, protocol and data layer kind of they get at the right. Yeah, they get they get at the right thing. They're 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 at the. They're where it's the layer at which data gets transmitted and received and communicated, gossiped, everything. Uh, yeah, it's definitely the layer of the protocol too. So it's, uh, and then there's like the framework, which is, or the engine as I sometimes call it, which is like whole chain itself. And then there's the DNA, which is like the application running in the container. And that's, um, it's the whole back end. <laughs> mm -hmm. That <laughs> bottomless, the whole back comes end. <laughs> together into the. It's certainly not the user interface, but as well, it's like, yeah, um, yeah. So I call it the back end, um, and then Acorn UI, which, um, yeah, you were mentioning React, um, Moritz, and we've been building, we've been building the UI in React, uh, though it's technically a uh, a blended approach because react doesn't necessarily handle data visualization well out of the box so um, when we see the tree here uh, when we see this whole application there's elements of this uh, this user interface that are react and there's elements that are um, uh, the HTML5 canvas technology uh, being employed for the data visualization aspect. So everything in here is being rendered onto a HTML5, HTML5 canvas. Um, and the big reason for choosing that is because you wanna draw edges on a coordinate system. Um, you wanna draw the lines and uh, it's just difficult to draw lines in between random coordinates in HTML because it wasn't built for that. And it's really easy to draw lines uh, between nodes on in something like Canvas. Or you can also use like alternatives that we could have used are SVG or WebGL. Like you can really go with any of those. We just Canvas was a bit familiar and um, stuff, but you could easily swap that out for one of the other for one of the other ones. Um, a canvas is really fast and still up to the task, I think, till you get really big, if it were, if it somehow had to grow to like a hundred thousand nodes or something. Um, and uh, yeah, so this middle part's canvas, the rest is all, the rest is all React. That looks kind of fun, looks kind of like a, I don't know, Christmas tree or something. <laughs> um, so these are the, those are the four repos and, uh, oh no, Acorn release. So Acorn release is the electron, uh, the electron wrapper that basically pulls in Acorn HC and Acorn UI um, and, and almost provides the glue that binds them together. And it, uh, it it's packaged with uh, you distribute. I say that you distribute when you bundle it into something like Acorn as an electron native app. You you're really bundling three things together. You're bundling uh, the whole chain as the engine, the core whole, the the whole chain binaries, and you're um, shipping the DNA of the, the app, you, of course, you don't need the raw source code. All you need is the DNA, which is like a kind of pre-compiled pre -compiled thing. Um, and also the UI is also not, you can just pull in the pre-compiled um, UI. That's all the assets bundled up together. So um, we came up with a workflow and I think it's good to outline how this workflow kind of comes together because it took some uh, I don't know, it took some, uh, some iterations to get to this point where um, releases, so development happens in Acorn UI and Acorn HC, and at some point you reach a point where 
uh, the two versions work well with one another, they're, com they're compatible, and you want to essentially bundle them into Acorn release. And so uh, what you have to do first of all is you have to build a new release of Acorn HC and Acorn UI. And the, the sort of end, the end asset um, that comes out of a Acorn HC is posted into the releases um, of this repository. So this is like the DNA of Acorn. Um, and we have scripts that generate this and upload it. This is the D DNA of Acorn at a specific tagged version of Acorn HC. And this builds and uploads to here. Now this is useful for a couple different things. Um, then you get Acorn UI. Um, and as well, we do releases over here. There's also three releases tagged at the same tag uh, with a little local local change log for what changed in the UI or what changed in the, in the Acorn HC. And uh, this one also has three assets. The asset here is a zipped up folder containing all the bundled UI files. Um, so that's, uh, you know, if you have, if you have the development code, this down locally, then you're just running this, uh, a, a familiar um, command to most web developers, which is npm run build and whatever happens to be inside, we're using Webpack to, to do the bundling, produces a, a bundle of the, the UI files. And when we, uh, we don't have the automation hooked up on this one yet, so it doesn't auto upload. Um, that's still a work in progress. Say what I wanna be able to do is just go and create, draft a new release, tag a new version, and then when you tag it, uh, or tag it or whatever, it'll automatically upload the new, the new bundle, but that's not hooked up for this one yet. It's hooked up for the back end Acorn HC. So anyways, you get this, um, you know, the Acorn UI, uh, zip folder, Acorn DNA. Those are the two assets that essentially in Acorn release, uh, when we want to build a new version, we use Nix, which of course is used throughout Holochain development and, um, and everything. And, and we did some tooling and um, build script stuff to make it so that there's a command. Of course, I don't want to show you all the inside of it, but what you can do is when you're in an Acorn release folder, you can run a simple command like Nix shell dash dash run Acorn bundle DNA. Um, you pass it a version number like 0 0.2.1 uh, and it's gonna go to, it's gonna go to GitHub, grab that, grab that DNA, bring it down. And then that's gonna be the version of um, the Acorn DNA that you're gonna that you're going to bundle into this electron, this this version of the native app, and you do this. You do the same thing. Um, still working with automation for this one too, so it's slightly different. But you do run Acorn bundle UI, um, and that goes to the UI repo, brings it down. In this case, it's actually building it itself, but technically, it should just be grabbing the pre-built one. Um, so yeah, how I want it to be is it grabs the pre-built one and just downloads it and just caches it locally. But here it runs the it runs the build the compile step for the UI, uh, which again I don't want it to do, but that's how it currently works. And um, this takes a second. So then there's a third step that you get to which is it shall run uh, acorn build mac. And I just run this simple or the, this particular command, but it's different ones. Um, acorn build mac unsigned. Now this uses an underlying tool called electron packager. Um, and it puts all my files into a specific folder and it's the command that takes all my source code and at the at the end of its uh, process you see it's packaging app for platform darwin that's mac uh x64 using electron 
that wrote a new app to this folder. So open, uh, open that folder and in here is my new, uh, my new Acorn native app. Of course, I had to tell it which, which icon I want to use, but all that stuff is configurable. So if it were someone else's app, um, they could easily swap in a different icon. Uh, and essentially, and being all open source, all of this tooling is stuff that people could reuse. And I would encourage people to reuse um, the tooling that we've developed because honestly, we've probably spent, well, I've probably spent half, uh, almost as much time on like automation and tooling and blah, 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 like basically just set up um, workflow setup as I have writing the application front end, back end stuff. Um, it's very underestimated workload, but anyways, if you can, if we can forward that, um, that progress that's been made on into the ecosystem, then I feel like there will be. That's one of the key things I wanted to show actually in the code walkthrough of Acorn was actually not Acorn so much as how the project is actually set up and stitches together and comes together into a, a, a polished look and looking and feeling uh, native application. Because I think this is important for people to see and for people to understand that this is possible with Holochain to get to a, a single um, one one click download, you know, um, launch and it launch and it works. And the fact that it's running on Holochain, people shouldn't really care. <laughs> um, so okay, so those were the repositories, and. Um, there's a there's a little bit of code, as I mentioned, that uh, that is electron specific. That um, I don't want to use that. Uh, it's pretty much all the electron specific code is in one file main.js in Acorn release. Um, this is to kind of provide the glue that connects together our user interface and Holochain. It takes care of the Holochain side of things. So it actually, um, uh, it, it basically spawns child threads or child processes. Um, of the, the Holochain binaries and the Holochain engine underneath uh, when the Electron app starts up. So it actually just calls into, say, uh, the, HC, the, the Holochain command, which is essentially the Holochain engine is this Holochain binary right here. It's a binary pre-built for, for Mac in this case, but you can also do this for Linux. This is all works on Linux too. And um, and so we have like uh, we have commands in here. Essentially, the very basic premise is that um, we look in the file system when Electron starts to see if uh, the user has already launched the application once. Because if they've launched the application, what we want to do is um, reuse the private key or the, the keys that were generated, reuse the storage that was set up, allocated in the file system. And, um, and all of that stuff just goes into a folder, which is the de, the de facto folder within, uh, within whichever operating system you're using. In this case, it's Mac. So it goes into uh, library application support slash acorn this is the folder that it um that it goes into by default that it uses as the application storage and everything related to this that needs to get persisted to the disk is here the key stores the, the private key the private key public key pair the conductor config is the um 
basically the thing that de determines the hall chain configuration. Uh, it needs to reference the key store and the storage. It configures the networking. It configures everything. And then storage is, uh, storage is um, just classic hall chain storage. It's, it's, um, there's the two main things, the EAV and the CAS. That's content addressable system. Uh, or storage, sorry, for anyone interested, and that's entity attribute value. Those are two underlying uh, data structures that Holochain uses to uh, persist its, its DHT and, and source chain. Um, so anyway, so there's the, the, the folder that gets generated. And when you launch the application, it looks for the existence of this key store file which also would indicate the and the, the conductor config. And if it isn't there, then it generates it. So uh, so that's this stuff here. If the key store exists, then it goes straight to starting the conductor. If the key store doesn't exist, you now we see this message could not find existing public key now creating one running setup. So it does a bunch of setup stuff on the first the first time that you launch, including HC key gen, which, um, uh, which generates private keys. Right now we're just passing null passwords. This is not a long-term solution. This is, um, the encryption is just happening on a null password, which, uh, which is not, that's, that's not ultimately secure. That needs to be changed um, to actually like prompt the user for password and get them to themselves know how, what's what the what their keys are encrypted with uh, then yeah it, it sets up the conductor configuration and then starts the conductor on the first launch so there's a there's a first launch and then there's on a second launch it goes straight into starting the conductor which calls the holochain binary with the configuration here and um, then it this is just all of this stuff is just it capturing the logs from Holochain and funneling them through into the electron-based logs. And also if Holochain crashes, the electron app will crash. There has to be a relationship between the underlying Holochain process and then electron, which is essentially its parent process. Electron is managing Holochain in this case. That's the important thing to take away from it. Um, yeah, it's that electron is electron is managing the the hall chain thread um, as well as the hall chain configuration file, and uh, it's responsible for knowing when to generate the keys and when to just pull up the keys and stuff like that. So all of that stuff is happening at the layer of at the layer of um, electron. But yeah, that's pretty much the only file for the electron part of things. The rest of it is all logic that's built into the user interface um, or built into the back end. That's a really quick intro to Acorn release. Now I would uh, I'd hop over to say Acorn HC and Acorn UI to give you a quick uh, quick peek there. So I just have these different projects sitting side by side. Uh, in a directory on here. Uh, Acorn HC in Holochain development projects. Um, there's usually a Nix configuration, and there's usually uh, the zones folder. There's usually a test folder, and um, those are the those are the basic those are the basic building blocks. We do a couple things maybe differently than some other people, like um, using a Holochain conductor config within Acorn HC to uh, for just running and developing Holochain because at least I've found that I want to configure it more than um, there's a 
there's a development command in the HC binary called HC run. I find it doesn't give you the control that you want and that I prefer using uh, the Holochain binary and passing it a conductor configuration so that you can tailor it more to your context, for instance, logging or networking or whatever in the configuration. Um, yeah, diving into the code. Uh, all zones, all zones look like this, but when you drill down, um, we've only got a few, we don't have that many entry types within uh, the Holochain side of things. What we have is a profile which describes some profile info and um, within goals, there's a few more. There's, I think these are all types. There's goal members, which are who's on a goal, which people, which squirrels. Um, there's votes cast on goals with uh, urgency, importance, impact, effort, the metrics we saw in the UI. There's comments, there's edges, which are, um, these are, of course, the edges between goals. And status and hierarchy and time frame are all sub properties on the key or central uh, goal struct, which has all of its um, immediate metadata like hierarchy, status, description, time frame, all that stuff on it. And um, there's always kind of the, the, the thing where you usually want to deliver data in a slightly different shape back to the UI that is technically stored in Holochain. So there's a couple of structs in here, like these are all examples of it, where um, these are structs that are just defined for the purposes of passing data between Acorn HC and Acorn UI. So you want to, because you want to pass all of these addresses and stuff like that on the data too, whereas, um, you actually have to, from this data structure, you have to actually have to calculate the address. Um, here to the UI, we actually want to send the address in a lot of cases, which, um, for example, the address of an archived goal, just send back. Uh, if you archived a goal, you automatically archived all of its comments, votes, members, and edges, and all this stuff. So uh, you, you send back the addresses of everything that got archived because you tried to archive a goal. That's just an example. Um, yeah, so these are the actual Holochain entry types that reference the Rust structs like this. Um, the edge definition, goal definition, uh, goal comment definition, goal member definition, goal vote definition. Um, here in the code, all of this stuff is related to the signaling work that I mentioned, which allows the Acorn HC to publish messages to other peers and to let them know that there's some kind of new uh, new piece of data. And um, yeah, so it sends it to a peer and then the peer the, the peer receives the message, sends it to the sends it to the UI. There's a whole chain reaction of events there that I I could go into the whole thing. I might at another time. I think it's too much to too much detail right now. And then, uh, yeah, just all your zone functions, like create goal, archive goal, create edge. Um, basically, it's kind of like a, a, a CRUD. Yeah, you have a CRUD type system, like create, read, update, delete, but also like a fetch. You usually have a fetch, like fetch all goals. And uh, the first time that you launch the application, of course, you do want to fetch all the data that exists. So one time and one time only, you fetch the full data set when you launch the application, all the goals or all the edges. And then after that, it's more, uh, it's more efficient, it's more performant because it just receives push notifications. But 
obviously when I launched the app the first time, I want to see all the data. Uh, and so it just goes and fetches the full list, all the goals, all the edges, and renders all of that immediately. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go into all the archiving, fetching, all that's going on all in here. And uh, lib.rs covers how some of the, uh, another element of how the signaling works. Um, these are all signals that are going to get sent to the user interface um, with, with new data in their, in their payloads. This is an overview of that too. Um, signal UI all relates to relates to signaling. And then you have the core thing, which is really of Holochain, which is that you define your zone. Uh, you define some of the key hooks like a, a, a validation, initialization, receive, um, and then all your entry type definitions. That's all of these just referencing other other modules and also uh, declaring all of the zone functions that exist on the on the zone that's that's all here but all the real source code lives in modules um, and the lib.rs the kind of like the top level thing that declares the zone it just uh, it just yeah, it's kind of an overview and and, uh, and references all the all the inner modules. Um, I'll stop for a second. Possibly that could be the end, or or just at, check if there's questions and um, see what's coming up. Hey, Connor. Uh question yeah. so in this design uh have you come across like you know just like design patterns or what not to do um in in yeah. this you know in development of acorn up to this point yeah um yeah, the the big the big sort of polling bulk fetching thing was was big one um from the UI. So just because I hooked up a function in the back end where you could just fetch all the data, it became tempting to just call that function again and again, which is I think why it kind of led me down that path of like, okay, we'll just pull and request all the data over and over again. Um, and so that obviously turned out to be a mistake. Um, and the fact that I was able to change over the pattern to utilize the signals in an afternoon showed me just how ill-conceived that was, um, how I'd been thinking. I think I'd been thinking it was more work to implement it than it was, which is why I had, why I'd been kind of like putting, putting it off or thinking like, oh yeah, I have to set aside a whole week or something to like, you know, pull this to make this big change. It turned out it wasn't such a big change or, Maybe it was just the right moment, right time, and it went smoothly. Um, but uh, that was a big, oh, another thing is that um, uh, in, the, in the UI side of things, you always want to manage kind of this, um, you want to understand the state and store the state in the user interface side. And so that probably connects to, um, like in a, in a traditional database, you would work with IDs and um, records would have IDs. And in Holochain, we don't have IDs necessarily unless you wanted to generate them, but entries do have addresses. But when you, um, again, just this thing where by default, when you do like a, uh, let me see, a get, a get entry. Um, oh, 
uh, get, get, get. Maybe in profile. Yeah, here we're sort of at least doing this. Um, when you get entries, when you get them back, like I, I, I'm i looking in Holochain for um, an agent's profile entry. And then uh, you might think that you just pass back the entry, but you want to pass back a sort of wrapped version of the entry where you can do this quite generically. There, there's a struct called a get response in which you pass back the entry, which is my profile, and you pass back address, um, which is like this app entry. Basically, you have to recalculate the, the hash or the address of the of the whole entry. And you want to make sure that you pass that back too. So this is where it recalculates that address for the app entry. Um, and you don't just want to send back like my profile because uh, probably when you're storing state in the UI, you want to be able to reference like the address of the thing. It's going to be useful like reference. So, um, so you just kind of wrap it in this struct like this you pass back the address and the entry. And I pretty much have to do that for everything. Oh, and that gets even more important when you use update entry and remove entry because um, that's another kind of gotcha because when you call update entry, the entry address changes. But when I store edges like this, I'm actually storing, um, like let's say that this is node one and this is node two and this is three. Um, when I store an edge and those are addresses, I say this is an edge from node one to node, node two here. And then if I update this node one that I don't want, um, and now it's, it's, it's address actually changes when you call update entry. And that's a trick too, because if you're still storing an edge that says this is an edge from node one to node two, and you pass back this goal, and now you've changed its address to node four, this edge isn't gonna render between the right, the right nodes because this address changed. So anyways, I had to write some custom code, and this is a bit of a trick to, um, to make it so that when you go and get a whole bunch of entries back from Holochain, I think mm -hmm. it's in, um, goals. It's an ugly function. I, there's got to be a way to clean it up. Let me tell you. Um, history of goal. Uh, you have to do like all this. I, this is horrible. I, I this I didn't even write this, but um, but the nesting goes like so deep. But the problem was that you you had to reassociate um, an entry that you received with its original address, and that took a bunch of work. But it was important in the end. Um, mm -hmm. It's interesting because uh, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> in the I, I, I'm not sure, but in the recent dev camp, um, mm. they went over uh, Hadaya and Gillum. I think they went over using the links to link two entries together mm. and then went going over the update case mm. where a newer version will have a different address. But mm -hmm. if you query with the original address, Horochain will automatically return Mm -hmm. the latest version mm -hmm. um, and then it will have its latest address and it's kind of that could be good in some cases but in my case it was bad because I wanted to go back to the original address I wanted to make sure that I had and used the original address of the thing mm -hmm. uh, because it was my reference point especially in my UI mm -hmm. for um, for rendering an edge between two particular 
uh, two particular goals. So I didn't want I didn't want the fact that the address of um, this particular goal, since it was updated, to be changed to have any impact on on the UI. So we had to kind of almost oh, work against Holochain. It felt like um, yeah. to uh, I mean, maybe there could be a way that Holochain itself be modified to essentially do what I did if you passed an option or something, or you pass an option, give me back the original address, not the address of the updated, um, of the updated one, because, um, yeah, you would think that you could, you would think that. You will have the option to. Yeah, you would want, kind of want that yeah. as an option, I think, because of, I think there's gotta be a lot of people having this use case, like right. where you just reference an address Mm -hmm. um somewhere in another entry somewhere mm -hmm. and yep. you you want to keep that tie back to that original um address and not sort of let it get lost in the changing list of hashes i don't know whether that right. breaks some idea that's built into holochain of like content based addressing it's almost just like using ids but i don't know how else to do it i haven't discovered it a different way um, yeah, I think that question came up too, and I think there was some discussion on you know whether currently it does support that option. Mm. I don't remember what what was the. Gotcha. Interesting. Yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure other developers are coming up against this challenge in their own way. Um, yeah. So I think this will be really good to share. I'm a I'm sure this is going to be a common occurrence mm -hmm, across mm -hmm. different projects. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So you just have to, it looks like in your code, you just have to kind of rewiring everything yourself, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, exactly. We're kind of recalculating, rewiring. It's almost like what we get back from Holochain is, is too um, raw or something or too, and we want to kind of, uh, we want to shape it as we, before we pass it to the UI. Uh, so that the, UK, the, the UI can do meaningful things that it wants to do with, with, the, with the data. So, yeah. Um, and I don't know if Holochain is actually the best place to be writing that kind of logic. It almost feels like it's not, almost like it should just pass the data out and there could be another layer where it's a little easier to write the code that handles some of, the, some of that stuff. Or may, maybe it's not, maybe it's the perfect place, but... It seems extraneous. It seems like all chain. You want to focus on the validation um, parts of things, uh, the parts that really need hollow chain. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I, sorry. Mm -hmm. Well, just thinking we should be wrapping up. Um, so I'll check with uh, uh, Jakob and and Moritz <laughs> and Carolyn and Pega and all of us. We just. Um, yeah, check out quick. Oh, thank you so much. We're just a bit over time, so. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. This is great. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's Some good. of the stuff yeah. went over my not yet as technical head, but uh, I'm sure <clears> I'll, I'll learn it quickly. And I'll be curious to talk more with you about um, possible ways for me to like find a small thing that I can do and like try to attempt to do something there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, and thanks yeah, for and, and, like. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, no. That, that I loved that you included also the workflow, so it has this kind of whole. Yeah, it helped me really get the picture. So thank you. Mm. Okay. Pega, did you want to just check out? Thank you, everyone. It was great just showing you our process. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was really fun. I, I really enjoyed it. Thanks everyone for, for coming and um, yeah, it'd be great to, uh, to get the recording from you, Carolyn, maybe, um, I don't know if you're, uh, 
and into doing anything like this, or or uh, I could participate or do it to like edit, do a little bit of just editing, just a little cutting. Yeah, um, I can um, send it to you. Moments of it. I'll send it over to you, and so that people can get most easily access it and get value from the recording. Yeah, for sure. Cool. cool. Thanks, everyone. Bye, we'll see you online. See you around. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.